Hello, my name is Dr. Christophe Auger. I'm Professor of Economics and Finance. Welcome to Mastering Money. This is session number two, The New View of Money. Lecture number six, The Neoclassical Model and Its Limits, Recognized After the 2008 Crisis. So what are the learning goals today? To understand the role of money in classical economics, what was the great moderation and what it actually turned out to be, why the economist Hyman Minsky was rediscovered after the financial crisis, and how leverage is connected to financial crisis in general. So first, let's take a look at the role of money in economic modeling. In the neoclassical theory, which is the uh, uh, one dominant paradigm in economics today, with along with neo-Keynesian neo theory, money is a unit of account or numeraire. And hence, it doesn't really have a real effect on the economies. This is the implications that the models have. Money is neutral. The majority of these models have been developed since Leon Varas up until 2009, and they treat money as a veil. And that's because the intent of these economists is to capture the phenomenon of exchange of real goods and services in the economy. Concretely, money is perceived in the aggregate as being neutral or a zero-sum game because uh, net borrowing and net lending is actually zero in a closed economy. Uh, the lenders are giving money to the borrowers. The borrowers can therefore consume more, but the lenders are actually postponing their consumption. So in the aggregate, the effect is zero. So this vision is consistent with uh, the, the banking sector serving mostly as a financial intermediary. And the important aspect of this choice in the models is that the financial sector has not been modeled in uh, and the potential destabilizing effects of, of the financial sector are not taken into account. And this is actually interesting to see that the financial sector has uh, increased, has grown as uh, in its importance uh, as a portion of GDP. And if we look at uh, the, the US economy in particular, we see that uh, over a period of about 200 years or more, uh, we have the importance of that sector that is now reaching about almost 9% of, of GDP. So what is the great moderation and what is the ensuing uh, phenomenon uh, that happened, which we know as the financial crisis of 2008. So when we examine the evolution of US GDP uh, from 1929, one is uh, kind of uh, struck by the observation that economic fluctuations seem to be dampening over time. In the 1930s, we have fluctuations on a yearly basis of about plus minus 8% in GDP in the business cycle. And at the beginning of the 21st century, for example, the 2000-2001 recession uh, registered barely as a blip in the, on the radar screen when we look at long-term trends. When measuring volatility using standard deviation on a five-year sliding rule, what we find is after 1984, that volatility and these fluctuations go from about 2% a year to less than 1%. This dampening is verified for real GDP and inflation as well. This trend is also confirmed from G7 countries. And this is very important, but this phenomenon of dampening of oscillations, economic oscillations and the business cycle has been referred to as the great moderation by economists Stark and Watson in 2002. <clears throat> in 2004, Ben Bernanke, who is the future uh, Fed chairman, gives a speech which is a really interesting speech where he actually congratulates his own generation of economists 
and implicitly congratulating himself as well for the good work they have done. In his opinion, the achievements of economic science, as he calls it, is that the uh, know-how of central bankers uh, is such that they have been able to really diminish the, uh, the impact of, of, of um, fluctuations on the economy and they have been able to stabilize national economies. This is the great moderation. But in fact, this great moderation was really nothing but a great illusion. The most sophisticated macroeconomic models at that time did not integrate money or credit and ignored the potential destabilizing effect of the financial sector. As shown by Steve Kinn in, uh, in his work in 1995, the Great Moderation was leading uh, slowly but surely to uh, uh, a storm and the Great Moderation was the calm before that storm. Inspired by the work of Hyman Minsky uh, dating back from 1985, Keane integrates the financial sector in his model and he is able to show that leverage, which is the level of indebtedness in the economy, is critical to trigger a crisis, and in particular, the one of 2008. So let's turn to Hyman Minsky and uh, let's explore his insights about financial crisis. So Hamed Minsky was a professor at uh, uh, Washington uh, University, an economist who was a contemporaneous economist with Milton Friedman, um, had very different views. Uh, he shows uh, in his work that excessive credit growth seems to be at the root of most financial crises, in particularly those associated with uh, speculative bubbles and banking crisis. When bubbles, however, when bubbles occur without being associated with uh, an, ex an unrestrained expansion of credit, the impact uh, of the crisis is, is not as harsh and banks seem to survive. For example, the high-tech bubble crash uh, that happened in March 2000 and, 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 and thereafter for about a couple of years um, didn't really have a huge impact on the banking sector. So Hyman Minsky puts forth his financial instability hypothesis and he states in it that the capitalistic system contains the, the seeds of its own demise, not in the same way that Marx uh, uh, said it uh, about a century and a half uh, before and because for Minsky the trigger mechanism is uh, the financial sector and excessive leverage. So what is the financial instability hypothesis and the crisis cycle? So let's look at Minsky's cycle so the cycle starts in uh, stage one with an initial shock in the economy, which could be a deregulation uh, at the national, national level uh, or technological innovation. In stage two, you have an ensuing uh, economic boom. You have economic opportunities that arise and in the real economy. In stage three, you have a sort of a euphoric uh, state that sets in and uh, the, uh, the banks are facilitating investing in the real economy uh, by uh, boosting credit growth. And uh, the monetary authorities are facilitating that credit growth as well. In stage four, you have the beginning of a bubble because now you have uh, investors who expect high gains and they uh, have an incentive in their minds to uh, buy assets at high prices, which generate uh, speculative bubbles, speculative bubble. In stage five, uh, you have what we call the financialization of the economy, where the financial sector is, is uh, trying to innovate and create new products, which are going to maintain high levels of return. And then in stage uh, six, uh, leverage reaches a, 
level that's too high, uh, the bubble burst, and that leads to a financial crash and an economic crisis. And in that case, uh, now suddenly people become oversensitive to risk and uh, they, they, uh, the investments and consumption tends to shut down. So Hyman Minsky puts uh, focuses uh, on the supply credit and in particular on the pro cyclicality of that supply. And it means that um, in periods of boom, credit is supplied in great quantity. So uh, credit moves with uh, the boom and in uh, recessions, which is a uh, sort of a austerity, um, a time of austerity, uh, you find the same thing in, in terms of credit uh, because the banks are becoming overly conservative. So these pro, this pro-cyclicality pro uh, tends to amplify the effects of, of the boom and the effects of the, of the recessions or depressions. So in the boom or expansionary phase, investors are optimistic expectations of profitability and they borrow more. Lenders are also optimistic and they tend to lower their aversion to risk, but uh, they do so uh, maybe unwisely. In the contractionary phase, investors have pessimistic expectation of profitability and they borrow too little and lenders lose money. So they become pessimistic and they start raising their aversion to risk to a level where they are uh, not lending enough. <clears throat> so rapid growth of credit creates high leverage, which multiplies risk. And we have several indicators of leverage, uh, which uh, could be the level of debt uh, for household divided by their disposable income, the level of business debt divided by the level of equity, so on and so forth, or the level of private debt uh, div divided by GDP. We're going to take a look at uh, a graph uh, that was um, um, so that we uh, borrowed from uh, Steve Keen, and which is really an interesting graph. And you can see that uh, the periods of peaks in uh, the U.S. private debt to GDP are the periods that coincide with two great crises, the 1929-33 uh, crisis and the 2008-2010 uh, the uh, uh, crisis. Um, Borio and Dreman show that when the ratio of credit to GDP and the asset prices are dislocated from their fundamentals, uh, the probability of crisis becomes greater. We still don't have an exact uh, measure in economics of this, this uh, particular turning point. Uh, you know, when is uh, high too high? You know, that is a real question. So thank you for your attention.